Lou and I thought we would chit chat a bit about you know what for a while. So um, if Ed Stringer would like to step out of the room for a few minutes, he's welcome to do that. Um, <laughs> there you go. You're a good sport, Ed. We appreciate that. So we'll chit chat. We have not planned this out. So it could be like the, I always give this example, the Beatles movie Magical Mystery Tour, their big flop. Because the plan was they would ride around England and just record whatever happened, and then it turned out nothing did happen, so it was a flop. So I, so there, but I, I sometimes I, somehow I feel like a conversation with Lou Rockwell, that's not going to happen. I just mean, I didn't, we didn't plan this out in advance. We thought we'd talk a little bit about what's going on in terms of uh, politics, and then maybe entertain some questions and, and go from there, and then Lou will have uh, some time to be speaking from the podium as well. So Lou and I had a conversation not too long ago, just last week, I guess, on my podcast at TomWoods.com. And Lou and I have been doing post-debate analysis episodes after the various debates. We did them after the GOP primary debates, and so we did one after this first uh, national presidential debate between the two parties. And um, for some reason, I get a lot of people saying, I'm not interested in politics and this and that, but for some reason... These people are not really telling me the truth because the most downloaded episodes of my whole show are the post-debate analysis episodes done, done with Lou. So we talked a little bit about some of the issues that were raised in that debate and some of the missed opportunities because personally, I, ju I just want that fake robotic smile taken off her face on live television. I'm sorry, you know, I just want that. Yeah. And... One thing we one thing we missed um, when we were doing the analysis was her point about she wants profit sharing. Um, that was mentioned earlier today. And David Gordon, our universal genius with the Mises Institute, immediately made the point, well, would that also include loss sharing? Because one of the reasons you want to be an employee rather than an owner is that you don't have to worry as immediately about profits. Because one way or another, you're going to get your paycheck. Now, obviously, in the long term, if there are sustained losses over and over again, quarter after quarter, you're going to lose your job. But in the short run, you can weather that because you'll still get your paycheck. If you had to share that constantly, that would give you an uncertainty that a lot of people don't want to bear. So if there are companies that can attract employees who are very prone to risk or who, who are... Uh, have an appetite for risk, maybe they would want to have their income pegged to the fortunes of the company, but not everybody wants that. They want to know, I want to be able to make sure I can make my mortgage payment every month, come what may, with the fortunes of the company. So that would be one particular point. But Lou, in the aftermath of that debate, I think the, you know, the media consensus was that she showed she was much smarter and more prepared there's been a more popular level consensus, though, that he basically just – he still wins to some degree because he, he stood there as a tough guy, and he didn't, he didn't completely fail, and he had a very low threshold that he had to meet for success given how low the expectations were. How do you look at this now that we've had a week to look over all the commentary from all these different people? Well, Tom, I think it's true that, that – uh... I would say even even the more honest polls show that people think he won on points. Although I, I must say my 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 view was that he lost on points. Um, so I think um, you know I think all the I think the fact that he discussed Justin Romano had a good article about this the, the pro peace points he made uh, that he uh, was not for a, a nuclear first strike, which of course is considered a horrible thing that. Uh, a president would ever say they're not going to do that. Why the president has to be prepared to destroy the earth on any at any moment that he thinks is necessary. I was wondering if we talk about dictatorship. What about the fact that one guy can choose on his own say so to destroy the entire earth? I mean, is that illegitimate power? So the fact that Trump said that, I hope he means it. Um, but I think the whole foreign policy thing is very, very important. Murray Rothbard always argued that that. Uh, as he put it in a, in a private letter in the 50s, he comes to the conclusion the whole libertarian thing uh, uh, was really about war versus peace. Uh, so we have, I think there's even indication that uh, some of the deep state uh, is pro-Trump, not for reasons except the war and peace question. I think more and more people think, as they look at Hillary, 
she's actually capable of uh, uh, starting a nuclear war with Russia. That she actually, whether that would be your intention or she just keep pushing, 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 and then uh, and then something uh, unexpected happens, or whether she would actually launch a first strike. But I think uh, many of us feel she's capable of that. And uh, there are even aspects of the deep state. They don't actually want the world destroyed. They like their lives. They like running everything. And, and uh, they're concerned about that. So Trump overall made, uh, I think, failed to make many, many points he should have made. Um, a lot of the stuff he said was wrong. A lot of it was grandiose and uh, uh, maybe even slightly crazy. Uh, although, isn't everybody except Ron Paul in politics crazy? Um, but I think the war and peace question, um, I think that what he, what he had to say about that helped. And again, the fact that she looked, I mean, she, uh, for example, where did all her wrinkles go? Just to just ask that. Uh, I have wrinkles too, so I'm not criticizing her, but um, all her wrinkles, jowls, pouches, and so forth just were gone. Was that all makeup? Was it Botox? Was it... Uh, some Hollywood magic, I, I don't know, and you notice this is never addressed. Uh, but I thought she looked, she really looked like a, an older version of Cruella de Vil. I mean, she was a very repellent, <laughs> repellent figure, and it's, it's one thing that uh, the anti-Clinton forces have going for them. Nobody likes her. Even the most ardent Democrats, they don't like her. She's a very unlikable person. She's, a, I would argue, a scary person. Uh, but she definitely is, is eminently hateable. And uh, I think that came through in that whole, that whole debate. People just got sick and tired. We know from some of the uh, focus groups afterwards, they didn't like her looks. And they thought that Trump, despite the crazy hair and, and, and all the rest, uh, was a much more likable figure. Uh, we hope that people are right to put their trust in him. Who knows? As Butler Schaefer always says, no matter who wins the election, Whatever party wins, the state always wins. So um, maybe things are, are such that Trump, who did criticize the Fed, by the way, talked about there being a bubble, talked about what they were doing to interest rates. Just to raise those questions, only Ron Paul has ever raised those questions, to my knowledge, ever in American politics at that level anyway. Um, so I don't know. I also think it's good news today that Nigel Farage is coming over to, to help prep him for the next debate. And of course, Nigel Farage is one of the great debaters and uh, orators uh, of our time. I think this can't, this can't but be uh, a problem for Hillary, but we'll see. Um, I, do, I do think just from a, from a, uh, a personal, personal level, I find this campaign very fun. It's, it's just, usually I, I find politics just very much unfun, uh, but I think the fact that uh, uh, it's just hilarious. Um, so at least we're getting a little entertainment for our tax dollars. We don't get much for our tax dollars. <laughs> once in a while, as in the Clarence Thomas hearings, if, once in a while you get something that is funny and uh, you get a little something. So uh, we'll see what happens. Um, of course, Trump is wrong on so much. Uh, as I pointed out to Tom before, I think Hillary's wrong on everything. I mean, she's like 100% wrong. Uh, and. I feel dangerous from a, from a war and peace question. And um, she really is a neocon. Uh, she's uh, joined at the hip with the neocons, who are the craziest people on war and peace questions. Uh, for, you know, sort of the, the if we think of the American establishment, just use a, uh, a one word description, sort of the Rockefeller types within the American establishment. What they liked was the original Cold War. It was just ideal. Nobody. They didn't have to worry about Washington or New York being nuked, and yet they could uh, get everybody stirred up, uh, everybody supporting the state, everybody supporting the policies that would further enrich and empower them. But there seemed to be people, I think back to Herman Kahn, uh, the famous neocon of the 1960s, who wrote a book called Thinking the Unthinkable, about why the U.S. should be pre prepared and actually should engage in regular nuclear wars. This would be just great for the whole world and for the American empire. There are people who have these kinds of views. Uh, they're all around Hillary Clinton. Uh, some very bad people around Trump too, but by and large, the people who um, might endanger life on earth um, are around Hillary. So we'll see what's gonna happen in these next two debates. I do, I do tend to think 
um, that Trump is going to win. And uh, of course, you, it's always trouble when you get what you ask for, right? I mean, it's so we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, but it's, it's just tremendous fun. Let me say a, a quick thing about uh, Hillary and her personality, because her the people around her are saying, if only the country could see the woman we see, the the thoughtful, I mean, right? Have you read this? The warm, wonderful person we all know. Um, and of course, these are not the stories you hear from her bodyguards and stuff, you know. But to me, the most revealing anecdote I've heard on this goes back to the 1990s when her friend Lonnie Guineer was up for confirmation by the to the Supreme Court. And Guineer was getting savaged by the right wing. Like they were just, she was not going anywhere and she was flailing and it was, it was a terrible situation for her. And there was a, now, so, you know, Hillary by that point had figured out, well, this woman's a loser for me. So Hillary has already mentally moved on. So she's in a situation where the two of them literally cross paths. Now here's Lonnie Guineer absolutely wrecked and crushed by this whole scenario that the Clintons put her in by nominating her. And Hillary just said, hi, and walked away. Not a, oh my gosh, I am so sorry what you're going through. It's, it, it was more of, look, you're done, you're toast, and you're not going to help me any, so I'm already moving on. I think that is a glimpse into who she, but not just her. That's a glimpse into who Bill is, a glimpse into who all these people are. That, that's why I feel like a lot of times when I walk around Washington, D.C., and I, and I walk past some of these people, I just get the chills. On the other hand, people who go in politics, people who rise in politics, tend all to be, um, exhibit narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, many of them are psychopaths. Um, that's a good argument against the state, right? Uh, but uh, again, I, I find this all to be fun. Uh, one other thing I'll, I'll enjoy is the fact that everybody hateable hates Trump. So that doesn't, that's not an endorsement of him. Doesn't mean we know anything that's going to happen. But it is fun. I enjoy, I enjoy uh, seeing everybody on all the networks just vibrating with hatred. And uh, so that's, it's, it's, happy to, it's, a happy, it's a happy thing to see them unhappy. <laughs> so questions? Uh, not a question, just a comment. Um, I uh, run a dog business, and part of our dog business is uh, selling uh, Trump and Hillary chew toys. <laughs> they, they've been a fabulous success. <laughs> Trump is ahead three to one. <laughs> There have been countries in the world, by the way, where doing that would put you in jail. So at least we still, we can still have our dogs chew them up. <laughs> it was fun. Hi, um, my name is Geary. I'm from Brookline. Okay. And I have a question about whether we need a pure candidate to be successful as a movement. We idolize Ron Paul. I think everyone here loves Ron Paul, but he's just one man and he's getting very old. Um, there is a Libertarian Party, Gary Johnson. Now, when we hear about the philosophies of Rothbard and anarcho-capitalism, the American people are never going to go for something called anarchy. So is there some permissible level of, I don't want to say watering down, but is there some other mechanism other than anarchy? Maybe it's we promote local government, something that sounds less threatening as a means to the political end we're looking for? Or does it have to be pure? I think there's no question that's, that's true. I mean, Murray always used to point out if somebody's running on a platform of cutting the sales tax by one cent, got to be for him. I mean, that's, that's not the answer, but anything that's an incremental step forward, sometimes um, I'm afraid with Gary Johnson, maybe it's not actually an incremental step, getting better or with William Weld. Um, but yeah, there was one where Ron Paul, thank God for Ron Paul, and the example he set his whole life. Um, but they're going to be, you know, so if, um, I mean, it's enough for me uh, if uh, the world's not going to be destroyed as a result of the election. If that's, you know, but this is all, 
it's all a, it's a it's all a roll of the dice. All these people, and uh, the state is a roll of the dice. And we know, uh, so as Tom points out, there's many happy things to look forward to. Um, and then we have the the killers, the oppressors, the the uh, the thieves. You know, these are all these are all rotten people. I I will say, and I've asked people who know far more than I do. Uh, whether they can think of any other any example in world history where a businessman became a dictator, everybody tells me no. So I think it's having been a businessman, something very good about that. Um, so we'll see. Uh, but I think he probably is going to be the. I think he probably is going to be uh, the nominee, and then uh, those of us who didn't like Hillary will be blamed for every bad thing he does, and there'll be plenty of bad things he does. Um, but can it incrementally get better, even from a source? Who, who would have thought that this might happen with this guy? Um, so sure, absolutely. We don't. On the other hand, I think there's every reason in the world for a Ron Paul, who influenced millions of young people all over the world, not just here. Um, he has other, did other kinds of work. It wasn't so much the votes he got, although in his congressional district, he did very well. He won a lot of elections, even against incumbents, which is almost unheard of in American politics. So there's a, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom, let a hundred schools of thought contend, right? I mean, let, although when Mao said that, of course, he wanted to see who had bad views, and then he killed them all. <laughs> so that's not, that's not our view, but absolutely, there's many ways to do things. And uh, none of us know even a, an, an infinitesimal way to do it. And you could never could have predicted, or talking about things you couldn't have predicted, who could have predicted a Ron Paul? This guy would go from medicine to politics and change hearts and minds of millions of people towards liberty. It's just, uh, uh, as to those who say they want to go into politics themselves to copy Ron Paul, there's only been ever one Ron Paul. Doesn't mean there couldn't be a second, but at least so far there's just one. Uh, but what a great, what a great uh, example and inspiration he is. Just, just tremendous. I'll say just a quick thing. If I were running as a libertarian, you're right. If I were to say we should have competing defense agencies, I don't think that's going anywhere. But I don't have to – what I would do is – I mean one smart thing Trump has done as compared to Hillary is you at least know what his issues are. He's got three or four big issues that matter to him. I don't know what Hillary's issues are. I mean think about it, right? I don't really know what her issues are. She has an opinion on everything. But what is her focus? She doesn't seem to have one. As a libertarian candidate, which, by the way, would not happen, so please don't ask, but as a libertarian candidate, I would focus on four, maybe I'd pick four things, and I would hammer home on those four things that won't be discussed if I don't discuss them. And one of them would be, you know what? Here's what I pledge. I'm going to go four years without bombing anybody. There'll be no kids without limbs because of me. You know, so no, um, no child, you know, no, no child, um, yeah, right, exactly, right, exactly. No child is going to die unnecessarily because of me. And who else is going to take that pledge? So I would do that. And then, yeah, and then I would hone in on the Fed, because it turns out, contrary to what I thought would happen, Ron Paul did very well by mentioning the Fed. I actually thought he should shut up about the Fed. So see, see why I shouldn't be anywhere near this? I, don't, I have no idea what I'm talking about. But I would, I would emphasize the heck out of that, and I would make these simple points. And you can make that point that I made here simple, that they're trying to induce you to borrow and borrow and borrow to stimulate the economy. Now that you can't borrow anymore, what other trick do they have? The whole thing was a scam from the start. What do we need these people for? They have no idea what they're doing. You know, you can, you can pitch that in a populist way. So I would find a few things and really hit them hard things that the others won't be asking, and then you get people to say, why won't the others talk about this? I might just mention one quite quick thing about Ron Paul. When he was campaigning in 2008, he went to the University of Michigan. Everybody's surprised he got more than 4,000 kids in the quad to listen to him, and he's giving his normal speech, and he hears, he hears these sounds from the audience, and then he realizes they're all chanting, end the Fed, end the Fed, which is where he got the title of his book. And he said, kids started lighting dollar bills on fire and holding them up. <laughs> sort of a take that Bernanke uh, a moment. Um, so the people care about the Fed, especially now, especially as they come, as Tom points out, as they're coming to realize 
what a horrific institution this is, how, how damaging, how many lives it's shortened, how many people it's put into poverty, how, uh, how it's funded the wars. You never could have had world wars without central banking. So there's opening on those kinds of issues too. But I like Tom's anti-bombing pledge. <laughs> yeah. I'm voting for you, Tom. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Lou. <laughs> Gentlemen, could you give me a thoughts on uh, Elizabeth Warren's rising popularity and her chastising the Wells Fargo CEO, CEO a week or two ago? I didn't. I'm sorry to say I didn't follow it. I have so much traveling coming up. I haven't followed any current events the past few weeks. I'm just running myself ragged. Well, uh, you know, Elizabeth, the phony Indian, um, and somehow that's never brought up, right? If, if some uh, right winger had pretended to be part Cherokee and gotten into Harvard because of it and gotten a job at Harvard Law School because of uh, her phony Indian background, I think we'd hear about it all the time. So, uh, but she, you know, any president of, uh, any CEO of Wells Fargo, any big bank is bound to be a bad guy. I mean, that's, these are, these are uh, uh, not uh, market institutions for the most part. Um, so I thought it was good she went after him, um, but, Whatever is wrong with the president of Wells Fargo, and I'm plenty wrong with him, he's nothing like a U.S. senator. I mean, a U.S. senator is an evildoer, right? I mean, so at least the president of Wells Fargo is doing some good things in his life. Um, but this was, you know, it's very easy to grill people when you're a senator and you can, people can't really answer you back. And uh, you can't actually say, you know, I, uh, you're living off stolen funds, madam. Right? You're not, because they'll say, his lawyers will say, ah, you know, you can't make those kinds of comments. Uh, but I don't think she's as popular as she once was. I think that uh, um, I think she's a very significant figure in Massachusetts, unfortunately. But um, I must say, I don't think she has a political future. I think she's very unlikable too. And now she's not unlikable on the Hillary level. Uh, she's really an unpleasant, pleasant person to like to run your life, run your family, run your home, run your community, run your business, all into the ground. And of course, bring on war. Despite her alleged pro-peace, uh, you know, she's actually, of course, a warmonger. Exactly like Bernie Sanders, by the way, who for some reason people thought was pro-peace. Uh, always a warmonger, always uh, with the one, he, he, was, he opposed the Iraq war, but he voted for all the funding. Uh, and of course, tries to get military contracts for Vermont and all, all the normal uh, criminal activities of these people. So. But I don't, I don't, I'm, I hope I'm right. I, I don't think we, I don't think we have anything to fear except people in Massachusetts, uh, from Elizabeth Warren. And I'm from Massachusetts, so I care about that. Lou, I've always wanted to know, where in Massachusetts are you from? I'm from the town of Belmont, which is a oh, Belmont. Uh, okay. suburb of Austin, right, right next to Cambridge. Extremely left-wing, um, like everything else in eastern Massachusetts. So they Except heard the you were coming today, and are they having Lou Rockwell Day later over That's, in Belmont? They're planning it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the day, I used to be the editor of the Belmont Citizen newspaper. Hey. Yeah. And um, one of the things I've been hearing today and everywhere is that there's a tremendous amount of despair out there and in, inside me. And I heard recently of a website called VoteAnyway.net. And what it is is uh, it's, it's selling a voter assistance device which is essentially a clothespin, specially adapted so that it does not hurt when you put it on your nose and go into the polling place. And one of them says, voting for Hillary, and the other one says, voting for Trump. So voteanyway.net if you're feeling great despair and you are uncomfortable about making either of those choices. I'll just um, have a, a slight dissent on that. I think it's much more fun not to vote, first of all. You're not going into that government environment of the voting, the, the voting booth area and having to park and go through a hassle. But your vote doesn't matter. And it's at a sacrament of the state and all those kinds of, but just in a fundamental sense, unless the election is decided by one vote, let's say in the, you know, if uh, our electoral votes in Massachusetts allocated by congressional district, but whatever is the, whatever is the, uh, uh, the area that you're voting, is it going to be, you know, nothing's decided by one vote. But once in a great while, some little mayoral election is decided by one vote. Your vote doesn't count. Your vote doesn't matter. So uh, I have nothing against if you want to vote. That's, you know, that's fine. 
But I must say I get much more fun out of putting a clothespin on the whole system and just having nothing to do with it in that practical sense. Um, I just want to say, um, at least in my lifetime, the past 20 years or so, uh, Massachusetts had had a history of Republican governors. And I think that's because a lot of the towns outside the cities of Brookline, Cambridge, Boston, and some of the Amherst towns out west, a lot of the um, towns are awfully conservative. So despite what the national media thinks of Massachusetts, the reality isn't quite that. We just get outweighed by the academics and the cities. Uh, but my question is, Trump supports a tariff. And uh, it's my understanding that the um, original, originally the, the, after the revolution, the um, main tax was a tariff. Um, so and I, in my opinion, the best tax, if any, would be a flat tax. So I was wondering if there could be some type of hybrid with a small tariff match with a flat tax to fund the government and what your thoughts on that might be? Well, I mean, if you're interested in, I mean, presumably you could. The, the, I mean, the difference would be that Trump's proposed tariffs are not, are not really intended to be revenue tariffs. They're meant to discourage certain kinds of activity. Uh, so it would be a, a it would be a pure bonus if it actually brought in money. The point is that since nobody would ever pay that tariff because it's, it makes the foreign good so expensive, you buy domestically. So th therefore, you don't pay the tariff. So he is not, he's not saying, let, let me think of what, what's the preferred tax form that the founding fathers would have been happiest with. They basically, they didn't all agree, but the early thing was to have a, a tariff for revenue that was not so high that no one would ever pay it. And then eventually that developed into a protective tariff. But the two kinds of tariff are very different because they lead to different consequences. One collects money for the government, one discourages people from buying foreign goods um, so overwhelmingly that it basically brings in little to no money for the government. So if you, if you asked Ron Paul, what would you favor as a tax, I'm fairly certain that his his argument was a very low tariff. I think that was about it. That's better from a civil liberty standpoint, too, if you don't have the IRS breathing down your neck. Uh, but as Tom points out, uh, a, a protective tariff doesn't bring in money, it's again, uh, whereas a revenue tariff has to be low enough to generate income, and that was the that in selling federal and selling federal land to people to homestead was also a, the other big source of government revenue in those days. There was no direct taxation. So um, Trump, uh, you know, tariffs, tariffs are a problem. I, I don't want to shock anybody. The U.S. is not a free trade nation. It's not actually, free trade is where I can sell something to some guy in Germany and the, none of the government's business. I can buy something from some guy in Russia, none of the government's business. That's, nobody advocates that except Ron Paul. Uh, so it's all control, non-tariff barriers, uh, many, many uh, anti-dumping regulation. The many, U.S. Is, is a protectionist uh, government, and every politician is a protectionist of some sort, with the exception, again, of Ron Paul. So, um, um, and I once spent an entire day, this is a terrible thing to confess, in the government printing office in Washington looking at the NAFTA Treaty, which is you know, a gigantic series of books, in those days, you could only see it in the government printing office, and it was on a chain with a hole through it. You could, you could, you could look through it. And uh, there was nothing in there about free trade. Every single thing was, here's a special deal for Caterpillar, here's a special deal for Westinghouse, you know, et cetera. Um, so unfortunately, the bad guys have been very successful in labeling all this free trade. Now we get blamed because of some of the bad effects of these trade deals or the, trans, the Pacific, Trans-Pacific business, um, which would extend IP regulations all over the world in a new and horrible way. I mean, just these, these agreements are not free trade, they're anti-free trade agreements. Um, so Trump, would Trump's taxes be worse? I don't know, he, his tax plan's pretty good. Is it all a fraud? Uh, but his, his, at least the tax plan that he's issued would be a huge improvement in terms of cutting corporate taxes and, and income tax rates. So um, I think people are not happy with the present system. 
Could it always get worse? Maybe it'll get better. Maybe we're lost to be alive. That would be a nice bonus. But the government's not bombing us, in effect. Uh, hello, my name's uh, Liam. I'm a high school senior uh, from Boston. Uh, my question is about the inheritance tax that Hillary wants to enforce, which, as you may know, she wants to raise it to a 45, 55, 65 tax bracket uh, setup. Uh, I would just like to know your thoughts on how that's going to affect the economy uh, in total and also how it, to what extent it is unjust to those who have been productive over their lives and saved up. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I always thought it was a bizarre kind of tax because the money has already been taxed. These earnings, you already paid all the taxes on them. So why would I pay again just because I died? And, and, and in fact, you know, sometimes people call it the death tax. So I was one time a few years ago, I was writing down for one of my daughters a list of all the forms of taxation I could think of. So I wrote out death tax, and she stopped me and said, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? But yeah, I mean, there are all kinds of horror shows about uh, small businesses having to liquidate completely in order to pay these taxes. It, it's, it's devastating to normal people, basically. Um, but, but Lou, what are your thoughts? Well, I was going to say, this is one of the items in the Communist Manifesto. Uh, Karl Marx, like his uh, disciple Hillary, hate the idea of... <laughs> people being able to pass anything on to their heirs or to charities, like the Mises Institute. We're very, very blessed to have people uh, leave money in their wills to us. Um, so, but the Marxists hate it. Even James Buchanan, the, the you know, sort of free market economist, uh, wanted 100% inheritance taxes. Pat Buchanan has proposed 100% inheritance taxes. This is... Uh, not a good thing. And the present oligarchs, by the way, like high, high taxes of this sort because it prevents other people from developing their own family fortunes. The state loves it because they don't like powerful private families that, they don't, that are not part of the state. Um, so from a, from a, a, a social betterment standpoint, uh, there should be zero inheritance taxes. Um, this is, of course, Lincoln had it, was the founder of the inheritance tax in America, like so many other evil things. And this has always been a big deal of the left. Um, I actually think Hillary made a mistake in advocating that. I think, that's, I think that was a, a stupid political mistake. It's one thing to whisper it to our friends, but to make that an open, I think, uh, I think Americans are not as envious uh, as they sometimes would like us to be. And people don't think there's a bad thing about somebody saving up and passing uh, something on to their children, their grandchildren, their church. Um, we all, we all like that. So um, I, I think and hope that she made a very bad mistake in telling what she really wants. She'd like 100%, I'm sure. Uh, but of course, they're greedy too, so they want money. Uh, they want your money. But um, they don't want private wealth accumulation of any sort while you're living or after your death. Lou, it's just about time for you to say a few words. But before we do that, I'd like to say a little something about the Mises Institute, if I could, especially here because I was at this institution when I discovered the, the Mises Institute. Back in 1993, I was a junior, and that's when I saw the magazine ad for the Mises University program. I mailed away for the information, and I got it. And I can tell you something. I mean, I, I told you before, I don't look back with regrets on my college years. I had a wonderful time, and I did a lot of great, fun things, and I learned a lot. But the Mises Institute has it all over this place. And I can tell you as somebody who was here for four years that I never felt so intellectually liberated as I did when I was at the Mises Institute's program. And that's what basically made me into the guy I am now and started to do the things that I, that I do now. It gave me a whole new way of looking at the world that I was instantly convinced of and it gave me a desire to carry on in this tradition. It gave me the tools I needed so that when the financial crisis hit, I could release basically the first book out on the financial crisis was written by an Austrian. Uh, that was my book, Meltdown. And that was a New York Times bestseller for 10 weeks. Now, how was I able to write that book in one month? Because I knew the stuff because I had been a student of the Mises Institute for so many years. 
That is an effective institution. And believe me, I do a lot of public speaking. I run into a lot of ineffective institutions. I run into a lot of institutions that blow a lot of donor money on nothing. You are paying for the chauffeur of the president of the think tank half the time. That is not the case. Lou drives himself. That is not the case. And Jeff Deist, he drives himself at, to and from the Mises Institute. So I, I want to urge people, if, you're, if you like what you hear, you like what you see at Mises.org, let's remember what we always say, which is that in a free society, we won't need to force people to build up educational and charitable institutions. They will do it voluntarily because they see the value in it. Well, let's put our money where our mouths are about that. And I urge you today, today before you leave, to see Christie at the table and join the Mises Institute and help us out because it is, and I, I don't earn a salary from the Institute, uh, I, I just like to promote it because of all the great things it did for me and all the good things it's doing in the world. There are a lot of think tanks you can go to that'll give you a lot of mealy mouth stuff. You won't get anything mealy mouth from the Mises Institute and that's why the sharpest young minds are going through the Mises Institute's programs. Help them continue that by becoming a member of the Institute today. Okay, that was my pitch.